That's it. Hello, everyone. Today is, again, third day. I'm Olga show at third day of Bitcoin conference here in San Jose, capital of Silicon Valley, in California, May 19th, 2013. And now we are sitting with an attorney who also was at Bitcoin conference. His name is Daniel Friedberg, and he working at the company Graham. Graham and Dunn. Graham and Dunn, yes. Um, and all the way from Seattle. Yes, thank you for having me, Olga. Okay. Yes, it would be nice to tell us about all these legal issues about Bitcoin and um, all of the legal terms and abbreviations maybe you can tell us, or regulations. Yes, it's a, a very new uh, area that the regulators are grappling with. But uh, here in the, really in the States, uh, the uh, the primary uh, source of concern has been from the Department of Treasury, and they're particularly concerned about money laundering and uh, avoiding funding of things like drugs or terrorist activities. So they actually issued a release, a Division of the Treasury issued a release about two months ago, and uh, in that release they indicated that Bitcoin exchanges should be regulated and they should be licensed as a money service business with the uh, U.S. Treasury. So uh, that, with that release, uh, the exchanges really were told that they should register. Uh, and uh, there still hasn't really been much from the individual states, but I anticipate that the individual states will also have regulations. The state's concerns are usually to protect the consumers, uh, while, as I said earlier, the Fed's concerns are generally for national security. So it's two sort of different views. But I would anticipate that we will be getting uh, regulations from the states as well. Well, I would see that also perhaps it would be taxes, maybe uh, avoidance, because you are in Bitcoins, and if you didn't include, do you have your assets in Bitcoins, then you can say, no, I don't have any assets, and then little would you know, they had lots of assets in Bitcoins. No, that's very true. There's really no tracing of the Bitcoin transactions, so it's going to create problems for the uh, IRS, our tax agency. Uh, they haven't yet uh, released any opinion on Bitcoin. Our neighbor to the north, Canada, their uh, tax division did uh, issue uh, that they they held that uh, gains in Bitcoin should be reported as income. Uh, I expect we'll get the same from the United States. Uh, but it will be a challenge for the tax authorities that unlike a bank account, it's much more difficult for them to track the transaction. Uh, but on another hand, as I heard, perhaps I just new to this industry, I don't know if you can call it industry, but new movements where if you have a wallet, uh, you can actually find out how much in that wallet of uh, how many bitcoins you have. Yes, a lot of people uh, use uh, companies to basically store their bitcoin. And they also, those companies also often sometimes provide a means of exchange. Uh, those uh, wallets are an easy place for you to store your bitcoins and you can see your balance. And uh, it is potentially trackable by the government because typically those accounts do require personal information in connection with them. Uh, so really, of the two ways to store Bitcoins, one would be to use one of these wallet services, and another would be is that you can actually just store them on your own, on your computer, or print out the unique address on a sheet of paper. Uh, a Bitcoin really is just a unique address, and whoever has that unique address can transfer that coin. So it's similar in concept to like a bearer bond, which is a type of bond that the holder owns it. And it's similar to Bitcoin, the person who has the address is the owner. All right, so when we talk with somebody and we were joking about money digger goals, now they can be Bitcoin diggers because if somebody owns Bitcoins, she can find out how much he actually has in one wallet. But then perhaps he can have few wallets with Bitcoins, how that's uh, traceable? And Certainly, they could have several wallets uh, using a third-party provider, and then in addition, they can you can privately store your Bitcoin address on your computer on a sheet of paper, and in that circumstance, there's really no record of it other than uh, the holder. In fact, that can create a problem 
uh, legally I have concerns with some of my clients who have a lot of Bitcoin. I often wonder, you know, what if uh, something would have happened to them, uh, either that they were disabled or that they were to pass away. It's important for people to plan so that their uh, heirs know how to access their Bitcoin. Because uh, if the address is lost, the coin is lost forever. There's no way to uh, retrieve it. Yes, means um, as much as they would like to hide it, they have to have trustworthy person to get access to it. And otherwise, yeah, somebody else will get it. So let's come back if somebody lost their lives and then they have this Bitcoin account and their average relatives did not know about Bitcoin's account or did not know that Bitcoins exist, what's happened to that money? Is it stay in that account forever? Yes, or? it would stay in that account forever. And in the case of the person who stores the address on their own computer and something happens to that computer, it can be lost forever. And there have been uh, uh, you know, a number of thefts of coins as, as things are hacked. Uh, a secure method of storage is something that's really needed in the industry. And I anticipate as it grows, uh, banks and other institutions will get insurance actually to back the holdings so there will there'll be more secure ways to store. So yeah, those hackings I guess uh, needs to be prevented. And even in money business, those hacking happened on a regular basis. As an attorney, what do you think um, what best out of using bitcoins? What are the best features of coin? Yes. Uh, well, I think the best feature is it provides a means to, to do frictionless, cost-free transactions. So uh, unlike uh, on the internet, uh, we often buy goods. We typically use a credit card. Right. Those credit cards are very costly. First, the card uh, charges the merchant 3 to 5 percent. In addition, there are chargebacks potentially on the card meaning that if a card is stolen or if someone says that their card was used improperly, they have the right to actually charge back those funds by calling the card company, at which point the merchant's account is deducted. Uh, Bitcoin offers both uh, no fees on any transaction and it's a final transaction in that once a Bitcoin passes from one address to the other, there's no chargeback risk. So those two features are really helpful in an economy. Uh, as far as investors see things, uh, are a nice attribute of Bitcoin is that the total amount of coin is fixed. So that there's a, a certain amount of Bitcoin that will ultimately be issued. And uh, unlike uh, government currencies where additional currency is issued year from year to year in order to provide stimulus to the economy. So some people believe that that certainty of knowing how many total Bitcoin uh, makes it a bit safer than uh, currencies that often inflate due to continued issuance. Well, considering that you can have 21 million bitcoins globally, and we have, what, about 5 billion uh, people, so I guess you can also break down one bitcoin into million fraction of bitcoins. So that's great, um, I don't know, we can have bitcoin milliardaires or <laughs> Bitcoin theirs, <laughs> I don't know, um, but making it a very unusual situation. Yes, yeah, so the smallest coin now is uh, eight decimal points, so point zero, 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 and then one. So that would be what's called a Satoshi. And so that's the smallest denomination of Bitcoin now, and that's named after the creator of coin, uh, Satoshi. Uh, but th th it is possible that that could even get small become even more denominated by a, a change to the program. So yes, it can be broken up, uh, and which is what allows the 21 million total Bitcoin to still serve as a useful currency, hopefully across the world, because by breaking it up, there'll be enough currency out there to do the transactions. Talking about creation of Bitcoin, uh, as an attorney, what did you, uh, you know, read and research about? Well, it's very mysterious, uh, but it was created by an, this anonymous person or group of persons. Uh, we don't really know who they are. Uh, there, there were some blog posts uh, done by uh, Satoshi, and uh, there he sort of mysterious or she sort of mysteriously disappeared. Uh, so not too much is actually known about the creator. Uh, his work product, though, the software, 
is what we call open source software. So it is available for all to see on the internet, which is really what helps its validity in that uh, the software has sort of been combed through to assure that it's fair and does what uh, it's, it says it does. So really, uh, although the creator is mysterious, the end product is really uh, op open for the public to review. I would think, uh, I don't know, but it looks like it's a lot of people involved in creation, uh, internet currency, and then you have to have cryptograph cryptographers, you have to have software developers, hardware developers to make this exchange happen. Some mathematicians and computer scientists create the algorithm, I, I don't know. Or Satoshi was really smart, smart guy, or he had a group of a team, the smart people. No, most most think that it is a group. Most also think that Satoshi is probably still amongst us at this convention somewhere. Uh, and it's uh, you know he's although he's anonymous, uh, most likely he's a big holder of coin, and is probably still amongst the community. It's just that uh, no one knows who he. He or, could create his is. name, virtual name, Satoshi, and um, who knows, uh, sounds Japanese to me, but could be any nationality. Absolutely. Could be anyone, or more, as you said, it's more likely a group. Definitely not me, because I just found out this week about Bitcoin. Right? <laughs> Unfortunately, otherwise I would have a few million of Bitcoins before I would release it to public. That is right. and. Uh, he, he probably wouldn't be working here today if you uh, Yeah, I would just send like employees. <laughs> uh, maybe I would be still interested to uh, talk to the smartest of the smartest because that's what I did. The whole conference, I was speaking with smartest of the smartest and finding out from the first hand so what's actually were happening and what could possibly happen in the future. So that's just kind of interesting because I also was talking about Olga Show coin and how that's possible <laughs> to do and what's adventure. At, what is advantage and disadvantage of having that. This was kind of interesting ideas and answers I had on return. So, so I had fun with that, definitely. Uh, so tell me now, are you working with startups usually or with companies? How does it's that work? A, it's an even mix. Uh, so I, uh, I have maybe about 10 or 20% of my practice is with true startup companies that haven't yet been funded. Uh, most of my clients have gone through some rounds of funding, so they're a bit beyond the startup stage. Uh, but here at the conference, which was nice, we really saw all the levels of the industry. And, it's, and it is very new, uh, so very developing. Uh, a lot of, all young companies really, the total value of all the Bitcoin in the world is about, well, I think 1.3 billion. So it's, even though that seems like a large amount for, for a currency, that's the total value of all the currency, and really that's the size of a smaller you know, public company. So it still is very small, uh, but there, it's surprising how much interest there is. Uh, it was really a pleasure to see you know, over a thousand people attend this conference and surpass my expectation. Now, why did you decide it yourself as an attorney to move it into Bitcoin field? Well, I had done a, a fair amount of uh, non-bank payment so that is payments by uh, companies other than banks, and Bitcoin really fits into that mold. And the regulatory regime in the U.S. is a financial services regime, so it really fit my practice well. I also have done work with uh, companies that have their own centralized currency. Uh, many social gaming companies like World of Warcraft and other of these social games have their own currency. And those are what we call closed loop currencies in that they are readily convertible to U.S. dollars. But they do have some similar features and the laws around those currencies are similar to Bitcoin. So although I've only been working in Bitcoin for about a year, uh, my prior experience was in other virtual currencies and uh, uh, also financial products. Great, so with your education, uh, what's your background? So I am uh, uh, both a lawyer and I also have my MBA and I majored in political economy in uh, undergrad. So uh, it's sort of a diverse background, uh, but I really concentrated on financial services products, and uh, I'm particularly interested in advanced technology in that area, and this is really the forefront of that. 
It's interesting how MBA computer scientist and economist uh, looks like. Uh, I see a bigger presence of them who created the companies and moved this idea of bitcoins forward. Yes, it's a little premature for some of the larger investment banks uh, to get into the space. Venture capitalists are now beginning to invest, but it's really the very beginning of it, and I think it'll be some time before the bigger banks step in. And even these exchanges that we see typically aren't run by uh, your typical currency exchangers that you'd see with, uh, uh, you know, on Wall Street. Uh, it's still dominated by the tech people, and, but that will change as the industry grows. I think in a lot of things uh, happens by tech people and then uh, slowly, eventually, other catch up with that. I agree. I mean, yes. not uh, many people had uh, computers and now everybody, or iPhone. And even I know when I got my tablet phone for my ma mom, smartphone, said, well, it's too small print, I cannot read this, take it back. <laughs> and now I cannot take her off of searching right there on the phone, small print or not, she likes to use it, so. Now, have you gotten your first video? I get gift cards, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I will open the account, I have to figure out how to do that, put those gift cards I got from gogocoin.com, and I'm thinking if those five dollars I can only put at bitcoins, might as well use that to buy bitcoins. You could get, so you'd get five dollars worth of bitcoins, Yeah, and, and hopefully in a few years it'll be five hundred. Right, know. and I saw people using new ATM machines, so I was so busy at the conference that I did not open Bitcoin account, but they're going to do that. And some people said, oh, just use your smartphone and create that account. And I'm like, how about on the computer? How about I talk to attorney first? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you'll be safe legally. <laughs> and then I uh, say, okay, as long as I didn't cash out, then I'm not really gaining anything, right? That's so, true. so I don't have to pay taxes on it. And plus, if I have like less than one dollar, one Bitcoin, that's still not a lot of money. I have to have a few hundreds of Bitcoins. Well, but there's nothing illegal about an individual uh, buying a Bitcoin for their own account and holding it and uh, even more and investing in it. So uh, for a typical user, there's nothing wrong with that. Although, as you, if you were to make money on it, you would have to pay taxes on that gain. So I withdraw, when I withdraw the cash out of Bitcoins, then I have to pay the gain, the on, gain that. Exactly. on that. And uh, so that would be good. But if I have to travel anywhere, I guess that would be useful for me to uh, use it as a payment. Sure. So I don't have to stay with extra rubles. I get just in case I have to pay for something unexpected. And now I just say, okay, let's transfer it back to bitcoins. And or if you have a relative in uh, Russia that you want to gift, you can send them a bitcoin, no charge, uh, and it will go from your account to his or her account. Uh, it's like kind of a very nice way for people who are doing international transactions to avoid any fees. And depending where in Russia, I don't know, hopefully they know where to get from Bitcoin to back to rubles or dollars. <laughs> I have to research that actually and see, okay, if I send it to Moscow, they probably would be able to get Bitcoin into rubles or dollars. But then I'm not sure about other areas. Where are they supposed to run? The, the exchanges are beginning to proliferate. Uh, and I'm sure there are in Russia good exchanges, but uh, in third world parts of the, uh, the world where really uh, Bitcoin has a very useful purpose uh, in places where the currency is not stable enough that people have any confidence in it. Uh, it it's a nice means of uh, uh, basically to store value. Uh, people in third world countries unfortunately have to often rely on putting their savings on prepaid telephones or just buying more livestock because they have no confidence in the uh, currency. This is a you know alternative to that. So uh, uh, it's but it will take time to spread to those other areas. But mm -hmm. I, but it's very useful for those other right, areas. Right, because you can always find merchants which could accept bitcoins, or perhaps you can do internet transactions. And I'm pretty sure a lot of internet companies would accept bitcoins because they would be aware of such a currency internet currency, I call it. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong in that. Maybe I'm making my own uh, interpretation of Bitcoins, but 
that's how I see that uh, people somewhere in Africa or Siberia can say, okay, I'm using bitcoins to make purchase yes. uh, through the internet or go to merchant who accept that. And that would be one of the way of doing it. Now, in terms of secure transactions, what do you think you see which one of the companies uh, best to use it or to know about? You know, there are a number of uh, companies in which consumers can uh, hold their Bitcoin securely, uh, but it is an area that needs growth. Uh, to have a bank that has insured Bitcoins, we do not have yet. So at this stage, uh, really the people who have the most coin choose to hold those addresses themselves. So they actually uh, do not hold their uh, Bitcoin through a shared wallet, but would instead uh, send it to a unique address that they either store on a special computer or on uh, actually a piece of paper in a safe deposit box. So that's really the safest, but there are companies where you can sa safely store Bitcoin, uh, one in the Silicon Valley, which is great, and one that I use is called uh, Coinbase, uh, and they are a great company. Uh, but it is a situation that if you really uh, invest a lot in coin, the biggest holders still hold their own addresses, because that's the safest uh, method. Now, who is your client comes to you? I, uh, so I represent a varied people in the Bitcoin industry. Uh, some uh, what we call Bitcoin miners who, who lend uh, computer power to the Bitcoin economy. Uh, also, the exchanges require the regulatory help. And then also uh, simply investors in coin. Uh, there are also a number of startup companies that provide software solutions for Bitcoin. One big area is this uh, need, as you indicated, for merchants to be able to readily accept coin. So we've, I've seen a number of startups trying to find a nice software solution that allows a merchant to accept coin uh, through their t current point of sale uh, systems. When you said that merchants can receive their money and then it doesn't really require to lose the money after transaction, then I see the other maybe some negative part to the customers like me if I go to, um, let's say, um, shoe place and buy shoe and try to return it some sort or cancel the transaction, then it would not be possible to do that with bitcoins. You're correct. At that point you'd be relying on the merchant to take the refund and you wouldn't have the insurance of a credit card where you could do the chargeback. So, but it is similar to just buying the shoe in cash in the sense that when you buy a product in cash you're relying on the merchant to honor their refund policy. Uh, you don't have the safety that you would have with a credit card where it's as simple as calling the card company and asking them to charge back. Uh, and that's something that may concern some of the state regulatory agencies uh, who like the charge back feature because it's a consumer protection feature. On the other hand, I know a lot of stores actually tell you up front, even when you come to the store, now they say this product is not refundable, not exchangeable, this is your first and last and bias as you go. And that's it, as is. And then it's, I guess you take a risk also in life these days. So I know you have uh, partners in your business. So uh, is he doing the same as you do? Yes, so we have about uh, 50 attorneys at Graham and & Dunn and we're one of the oldest law firms in Seattle about 100 years old. About 20 of those attorneys do financial services work, like myself. And as far as Bitcoin itself, it's really uh, myself and my partner Ryan Strauss also does work in the area. Uh, but uh, it's so, so we have a nice sized financial practice, not too big, but uh, big enough that we have the support needed for a company really of any size in this space. Now in terms of being in financial, uh, part of the businesses is your clients usually not your particular but your law firm um, banks yeah. yes I've done a lot of banking work and actually have done a, a number of bank formations uh, it was sort of a specialty of mine uh, due to the economy new banks haven't really been forming lately 
uh, but I still do uh, corporate work for banks in our area and some credit unions as well. But your like, I guess uh, I don't know. Started with a hobby, perhaps your Bitcoin. Slowly, eventually, you moved into business side of it. Yes, I found out about Bitcoin through the foundation about a year ago, and just became very interested in it. And actually, since I'm a lawyer, I became very interested in the laws surrounding it, and quickly discovered that uh, there weren't any, and that regulators weren't really quite sure what to do with Bitcoin. So uh, it, it's really a very interesting area, and it's also fast developing. Actually, we've learned more in the last two or three months about how our government is going to treat coin than we had, you know, in the years prior. And as a Bitcoin conference, I didn't see any other law firm. Oh, they were here, you know. Okay. They're, they're, yes. F and D's. <laughs> no, they're, they're, we certainly there's some competitors in the space, uh, and that's fine. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it is new, but there are uh, some, some other competitors in the space. As we see more and more venture company money going into the uh, industry, we'll see much, many of the larger firms, no, without question, now jumping on the bandwagon and, and attending events like this. I'm pretty sure venture capitalists and hedge funds would like to have attorneys in their pocket, or in front of them, actually, not in yeah. the pocket, yeah. no. They would want money in their pocket, so they will have attorneys right in front of them to make sure all of the regulations uh, happening, hopefully saving the money for all. Yes, and it's true. Uh, many of the venture capitalists who have invested so far are sort of the innovative companies who are taking a chance on a new industry. Uh, and the reason they do that is just because the potential returns are so high. However, there is risk because the you know regulations haven't yet been determined. But there are uh, some groups who actually specialize in innovative areas that are sort of what we would call pre-regulation and decide that it's worthwhile to take that risk because the upside in the investment is so high. Uh, but it will be some time and we, I think we need a bit more legal clarity before the bigger banks are willing to uh, jump into the space. When you did your research, what was uh, the most successful story you can uh, talk about in Bitcoin industry? Well, you know, the, there are um, are many amazing uh, stories of young people who were early miners and collectors of Bitcoin who are now multimillionaires in coin. Uh, so that's always a surprising thing. Uh, the largest company in the space now is uh, that is the Mt. Gox Exchange that has you know suffered some legal problems here, but uh, they certainly would stand out as a very large company. I would imagine that uh, you know they're probably making, it's hard to know since their numbers aren't released, but people would estimate that they're probably making about $5 million a month. So that's an example of a successful uh, company in the space. And perhaps uh, the most negative or unusual story uh, you learn from the, in the history of Bitcoin? Well, you know, there is a dark side to Bitcoin in that due to its anonymity, it has been used for uh, transactions that people like to disguise and this is a part of Bitcoin that we have to accept it's not a part that I like uh, and I'd like to diminish its role uh, but there is a, a, a site that's called Silk Road where transactions are done in Bitcoin uh, that purely because they're anonymous and uh, those uh, you know it's really that type of transact that that stigma which I think may hold back Bitcoin's acceptance is something that we need to get over as an industry. I actually prefer the more regulated, not anonymous regime than one that uh, you know kind of has a dark side. So there is, you know, the history of Bitcoin certainly isn't perfect. Uh, it's been used for probably improper purposes. Uh, its origins of the inventor disappearing is uh, uh, certainly. Uh, mysterious, uh, maybe even concerning, but uh, I think these are things that we can get over as an industry. And one thing that's very interesting here in meeting all the people here is the quality of the people. Uh, this is not an industry of people with poor backgrounds. Uh, these are very, very smart uh, young techies for the most part uh, and with good hearts. 
So this is, a, this is an industry, I think, that shows a lot of promise. Um, I would, uh, don't know enough history, but I'm pretty sure even with regular money, like rubles, we had ups and downs, and we had new rubles coming out, and people losing tens of thousands in, uh, rubles in their savings, because they could not get to their savings, and that was changed. And I know other countries struggle and suffer like that. And I'm pretty sure something like that with ups and downs of dollars and euros ahead of the dollars when American dollars was always pretty much ahead, maybe Japanese money. So uh, I guess any currency uh, successful and used for black market as well mm -hmm. uh, in any country. So not surprisingly, um, bitcoins could be used for that as well. That's very true. Um, so it's like a history. You cannot be perfect. Yes. If you don't make mistakes, how would you know that you're doing the right things when you're comparing? No, that's true, and I'm sure we haven't seen the last of the mistakes. Uh, you know, we're really at the beginning of the industry here, so uh, I think it's going to be a very interesting uh, growth path. So it's grown remarkably fast, but it still, in my opinion, has a long way to go. Now, I was wondering uh, how people will contact you. Would they contact you because of the, uh, your office in Seattle, but would you be working globally and, uh, or like, you know, usually a state low different from any other state? Yeah, to know my practice is really a national practice in this area. I do have some clients who are investors and owners of coin who happen to live outside the states. But for the most part, I am within the states. Uh, most of the people in the industry find me through the foundation. My contacts at the foundation are word of mouth. Great. So because Bitcoin is global currency, so it doesn't have to know the words or state uh, requirements. Just regulations which constantly changing, and you're waiting for more updates and hoping for more updates like everybody else. That's right. To secure mm -hmm. <laughs> those transaction and. Uh, money holding machines. Great, so what would you wish for our viewers um, in terms of? Well, I'd, I'd encourage them to be educated about Bitcoin. Uh, there are, I've heard people who are positive to Bitcoin and negative, but one thing that I found is that the more that people are educated, the more likely they are positive about coin. In fact, almost every negative article I see is by someone who hasn't looked much into it. So uh, I am an advocate for the industry, but really what I'd encourage people is just to find out a lot about it. And uh, I think if we just have an, that education, uh, the industry is really going to grow. Great. Well, with us was Dan Friedberg from Graham and, and uh, Don, uh, one of the biggest and oldest, 100, over 100 years old law firm in Seattle, Washington State. And Olga Show with you, from you to you. So thank you for watching us. Thank you, Olga. Thank you. Bye.